Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship, which is printed in your bullet. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is great, the great God, the great King above all gods. In him are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the flock under his care. The hymn is 701, God is here. Good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Dale. Our call to confession. It is a wonderful thing to be under the care of the Good Shepherd. He watches out for us. He keeps the wolves at bay and rescues us from our wandering into dangerous places. But like sheep, we too want to go our own way. 
We think we can keep ourselves safe. That false sense of security can lead us into sin. The Good Shepherd knows our weaknesses and he stands ready always to hear our pleas for rescue and forgiveness. Please pray this prayer of confession with me. Father God, as we come to worship today, we come with guilt in our hearts. You are the creator of the universe, and yet sometimes we try to step into that role. Forgive us when we stray from your commandments. Forgive us when our worship is not sincere. Forgive us when our words and deeds do not reflect your love. Forgive us. Hear our prayer and bring your perfect administration. Amen. <laughs> Words of assurance. Worship is not only about singing and praising God. Worship is the way in which we are renewed in fellowship with him through confession and prayer. Thankfully, we have a God who hears, who listens carefully, and who is ready to respond in kind forgiveness. We are privileged to be the people of his pasture. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please greet each other in love. Please be seated. Rather than inviting the children down for the children's message this morning, I'll say you can stay where you are. You can come down if you want, but I think you can stay where you are. And this, this is just a question for everyone as we do this uh, children's message. What is a missionary? You guys can raise your hands if you know. What is a missionary? Have you heard that word before? Ellie and Addie, how about you guys? What is a missionary? That's exactly right. Someone who goes all around the world and teaches about God. Yes. I could not have said that better myself. That's succinct and exactly right. Um, so we have missionaries that we support in this church. In fact, we have 14 missionaries that we support that do work all over the world. And they do all kinds of things, like they run um, orphanages for children that don't have parents. Or they build schools for children that live in communities where they just can't afford to go to school. So we build schools for children in some places. And um, all kinds of other things, too, like translators of the Bible. There's all sorts of things that we can do to teach about the love of Jesus all over the world. Any of you can look at our, uh, we have a, a board in the, in the hallway outside of the fellowship hall, which lists all of our missionaries. You can... Uh, learn more information about their work there. And we also do local missions. We help and serve people here in this community. And there are 11 different missions that we do right here in Dutchess County, like giving beds to people who are poor and they, they can't afford to even you know, have their own beds, so we provide beds. We also provide food for people that don't have enough food. We, provide, we work with the uh, Hudson River Housing and help them with providing shelter for people who don't have a place to live. So all kinds of things that we do to help people and to bring the love of Jesus to people. Well, this morning we have um, very special guests with us, um, our missionary couple from Boston. This is uh, Sarah and Nate Sobiek. And would you guys come forward? And we've been supporting Sarah uh, for the past 11 years. So she's been a long time missionary. And she and Nate got married, how many years ago? Is it seven, seven years ago? So we've been supporting them as a couple for the past seven years. And they uh, work with an organization called Crew, which used to be called, you might have known it in the past, as Campus Crusade for Christ. And what Crew does is it, it helps to bring the love of Jesus and educate college students, bring them into a community of faith um, in colleges all throughout the country. So they're working in, a col in colleges in the Boston area, and uh, we'd like them to give us an update of uh, what they're doing with Crew.
We can hear you, so it's okay. okay. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have the slides for this oh, service. Okay. Okay. best understood through three core values that we have, which the first is win. It's really just simply being able to introduce students to who Jesus is uh, and get some face time with them. Uh, and the second is build, where we get to build them up in their faith through life-changing community. Uh, it might be small groups, uh, Bible studies, um, and other events that we do. And then we want to see them sent to live a life on mission after they graduate, to be able to engage the people in the places they work or whatever vocation they share a little bit more about that here. Yeah, so one way that we introduce students to Jesus um, is just even help train our students like how to have spiritual conversations and what does that look like. And so one thing we do that's really fun, so when it's freezing in Boston in March, we go to Florida. And so we probably take about a group of 30 MIT students each year and we partner with a campus, um, the University of Central Florida, so they also have crew. And so we spend the week there just on their campus and engaging with other college students what do they, you know, how do they grow up? And like, what do they think when they hear God? And like, just all sorts of questions. And so um, it is just a really fun week. It's for students to just get off campus and have no homework for that week and just enjoy the weather and really take steps of faith. I mean, it's scary. Like, even though I've been doing this for years, like, you know, walking up to someone and just kind of engaging with them, telling them why we're here, like, you know, it definitely uh, takes a step of faith. And so it's very cool to see what God does through that week and just how our students um, come back to never heard of Jesus and don't have a relationship with him. And so they come back with a fire just to really like engage in conversations with their peers. Um, so that's been really a really fun time for us. Um, one other quick story. Um, so kind of on the, the, the build category that Nate was talking about, just creating life-changing community. Um, we have a student, Cher, who has become a Christian during college. So she's now a senior, but she came to know Jesus after her freshman year. And um, she had filled out a survey that we Christianity, and so I followed up with her. Um, this was during what I like to call Zoom year, so everything was on Zoom, so it was very different, but we got through it. Um, but I got to, yeah, take another student with me and just meet with her um, over a virtual call and get to know her a little bit, and she got to plug into some of the things that we were doing that year, and um, yeah, it's just really cool to see the journey. She got baptized in the fall of 2021 at a local church in, in Boston, and um, has just begun to have such a huge impact In the last couple of years, we, we've sent students from our ministry into places. Some of them you may have heard of, like Facebook or, or Google or Amazon. Uh, we've got students that go to work for Lockheed Martin and other like de defensive contractors. And, um, and we've got uh, students that, uh, a student this last year is going to grad school at Harvard Medical School. So they're going everywhere. Uh, and, and these companies employ lots of people. So their ability to impact the nation, just starting off, it's vast, and, and we just love their heart for you know, to engage the gospel, and, and our, our heart is that we've hopefully helped give them some of those tools and resources to know how to
share their story and, and engage others in a way that, that is comfortable and, and natural for them. Uh, again, we just want to thank you for your, your support. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about what we do, there, I know there's a, a pizza lunch after this. Uh, there's also, uh, we have a, uh, a board out on, in the, uh, the fellowship hall. Thank fellowship you. Time. The fellowship hall. And we've got a, you can take a card and you've got a QR code that you can scan and that'll also give you more information about our ministry and what we do and how you become a partner individually. So. Thank, you so Thank you. Yeah, excellent. I love the model of discipleship that you can bring students to Christ in college and then they go out and they serve in all these other companies. They serve in Google, they serve in Intel, they serve in, in uh, tech companies. Like I know there's a lot of tech in Boston so, uh, and Harvard Medical School. And um, it's, uh, it's just wonderful to think that we, what we're doing here is helping to seed the, uh, basically people's uh, life in Christ that then goes out and has a multiplying effect as they go out into the world. So. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, again, like they said, you can go into the fellowship hall for more information at the table. And then uh, join us for a pizza dinner just to hear more information about them. That'll be directly, immediately following this service up in the community room. Uh, so we'll, we'll be able to um, ask more questions and, and get to know more about their ministry. Let's sing together the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, hymn 622. Sunday school. <laughs> Just a side note.
I have a few announcements this morning. We need uh, volunteers to help serve in the nursery for the second service. Linda is going to be with a, a sign-up sheet in the fellowship hall at a table if you're interested in serving in that way. Um, also, we have our deep dive uh, Bible study that's going to be continuing today at 12.30, 12.30 to 2 in Classroom F for anyone interested in, in taking a deeper dive into the Bible. This is happening in four uh, classes. We started the class last Sunday, and I've been teaching this class. Um, this is a little bit like the Bible 101 class that you used to have. It gives an overview of the whole Bible. If you've ever wanted to know how all of the stories of the Bible fit into one um, overarching story, that's, that's what this class is about, and it's a great introduction. Um, I'd like to invite Sue Mock forward, uh, or no, I'm sorry, we already covered that in the last one, but do you want to give us a, a brief uh, update of how things went? And you can come up here to the, uh, these mics are working. Thank you. And I want to thank Sue Mock and all the volunteers who worked on this and uh, the mission team. Thank you for all your great work on this. We have uh, nominations for consistory members. We need uh, nominations for one deacon and one elder. You can just write the, the names down on a piece of paper, put that in the offering plate, along with your offering. And uh, then also we have, um, you can also send just an email to elders or deacons, uh, anyone on consistory, about your nominations. Uh, the family hike today has been canceled, and the financial peace class is starting tonight at 7 p.m. It's going to be a Zoom-only class, so it won't be in person. Um, if you would like to sign up for that class, you can contact Kim Skorlick, which is, her name is listed on the announcement sheet uh, that you see there in your uh, bulletin. Let us continue our service of worship with our tithes and offerings.
Another part of worship is the giving of our tithes and offerings. God calls us to give a portion of what is rightfully his back to him. We give not because our God does not have in abundance all that he needs, but because in our giving we are being obedient and are taking part in what God has ordained us as a church body to accomplish. Giving allows our ministries to flourish and our missions to be all that God wants them to be. Give cheerfully, for God loves a cheerful giver. Please accept these gifts and offerings that come as part of our worship. Use them to sustain and enhance the ministry in this place. Bless our missionaries and use a portion of these offerings to allow them to bring the gospel to the places where they serve. Amen.
as we go to God in prayer. It says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7, do not worry about anything. And there are a lot of things that we all have to worry about. Health, the loss of loved ones, struggles, all kinds of things that we're going through all the time. And the Bible says in Philippians, do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So let us now join our hearts and voices to bring our requests to God with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the joy this week of the birth of Birgit and Duncan's granddaughter, Birgit and Duncan's daughter Megan and her husband Ben Pearson. <coughs> Megan gave birth to a beautiful baby girl born on Thursday morning, Isla Lois Pearson, seven pounds, seven ounces. God, we thank you for the joy of new life. We pray for Isla and for her blessing, for you to be with her throughout her life. And we pray for Megan and Ben and the whole family as they celebrate this birth. And God, we come bringing you concerns. We pray for Nelson's brother's wife, Annette, for Rick and Bev Ryland's daughter, Danny, and her husband, Nick, who are, he's being deployed to Poland, for Joyce Sellers, who's at, at home after a stay in the hospital, for June Nuzo, who continues to recover from an extreme case of poison ivy, for Paul Koch, who's worshiping with us this morning after a stay in the hospital, for Priscilla, and for her mother, Patricia, Continued prayers for Joe Cristiano, who is in ICU. Pray for Lorraine Priory and her cough. And God, I'm thinking this morning about the families of the students who were injured and one student who died on Interstate 84 here this past week on Thursday when many students were in a bus, a high school bus, heading to a marching band retreat. They were from a high school in Long Island. So God, we pray for the students that were injured and we pray especially for the family that lost their uh, child in that accident. God, now we call out to you, simply call in the name of the people that we want to hold up in prayer or the name of people that we want to express thanksgiving for, for their joys in their lives. Hear our prayers. And we come to you in humility, praying the prayer that you have taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And Lord, as we open your holy word this morning, we pray that you would open our hearts. We hear when the psalmist tells us not to let our hearts be hardened as we hear your word. So help us to keep our hearts open. Let the words of scripture be refreshing and instructive to us today. And help us to use them in our walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 5. And this is a story that I'm sure you've heard before in scripture. This is where Jesus has been walking all day from Jerusalem. He's heading to, to uh, Galilee, and he goes through the, the valley of Shechem, and he gets to Jacob's well, and he, um, he has a drink at the well. He needs something to drink. He's been thirsty. It says it's at noon when this happens. So it's the middle of the, the heat of the day. And Jesus meets a, a woman, a Samaritan woman, and begins to have a conversation with her. 
And part of what is revealed in this conversation are, I think, six principles of worship. How it is that we are to worship God. So hear the reading of God's word for us this morning as it is written for us in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 5. Jesus came to a town in Samaria called Sichar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was located there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me something to drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with at the well, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. And later she said, Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews, you claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Yet a time is coming and has now already come when true worshiper, worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, and when He comes, He will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I am. The one who is speaking to you, I am he. Here is the reading of God's word for us this morning. May God help us as we seek to understand the meaning of these words. Amen. So there's a lot happening in this story where Jesus meets the woman at the well. But one of the things that's happening is a teaching about worship. What does it mean to worship? And I've been asking that question a lot lately especially since the new Pew Research Center report has come out. Pew Research Center is a reputable research institute, and one of the things that they research is they research the change in American life over time, and they've been doing that research for the past several decades. Well, their new report just came out this month, and I read it this week. The most, Pew, the most recent Pew Research says... And this is surprising to me, that only 13% of Christians in America today are actually worshiping God. 63% of Christians in America today identify as Christians, but only 13% are actually going to church. And I thought, what's happening here? And that represents a major change from the Pew Research Report that came out in 2014, about 10 years ago, which showed that 45% then were worshiping God in church. So there's been this huge change from 45% of Christians worshiping to now 13%. Is it the pandemic? What is it? What is it that's led to such a drastic drop in worship across the country? If you apply those numbers and those statistics to our own town, the town of East Fishkill, that means that we have 1,156 people here in this town who are Protestants that worship God, that actually go to church. And we have 16 churches in this area, Protestant churches and evangelical churches. And so that means that there are 98 people per church. And that's about right. That's about what we're seeing today. 
Some churches have 20 or 30 people. Uh, Hopewell is blessed to have 250 people worshiping here, but that also represents a drop over time from what we were 10 years ago. And so we're seeing this across the board. So I started to ask, well, what is it? Why? Why are we seeing this drop in worship? And I would have guessed that the reason, part of the reason anyway, was because people are now worshiping online instead of in person. But that's not the case. According to the Pew Research, only 2% of Americans are worshiping online. So something else has to account for this drastic drop in worship over the last 10 years. Now, we shouldn't be discouraged by these numbers because we have to remember Jesus started with 12 people. And the purpose of the church has always been to go out beyond the current believers, just like the Sobieks are doing, and to introduce people to Christ that are, that are beyond the current attenders. And more than ever now, we see that that's our urgent need. That's what we have to be about. I want to see more research on this, but what I suspect is supplanting worship is that our whole country is drifting away from faith in God. I think there are all kinds of things that are supplanting worship. One, I would guess, is family time. Weekend time is precious, and so people want to spend time with their families. But, you know, one of the best ways you can spend time with your family is worshiping God. That's such an important way to spend time with your family. A second, I suspect, is that people are spending more weekends away. And most people are not going to find a church near their Airbnb. Sports is displacing worship. Time on social media... There are a million fun things that people could be doing on a Sunday morning. It doesn't help that our media maligns the church, the scandals that have driven people away, and frankly, we as churches have not done a great job of helping people to understand that reason and science are not in opposition to faith. But I think many people today just don't know. They just don't know about the joy that's available to them in a life in Christ, in a life in a worshiping congregation. It's such a joy. This is an abundant life. This is a resilient life. I don't know how Sarah and I would have gotten through the devastating loss of the last couple of years, the last three years ago, losing a child. We couldn't have gotten through it without a community of faith. And it's a life full of meaning and purpose, a life infused with the power of God's Holy Spirit. So this passage from the Gospel of John, Jesus answers the question, what is worship? What is it? How do we worship? Why do we worship? And I think there are seven principles that I want to share with you from this story today about how we worship. The story begins, Jesus, it says, comes into Samaria through a town called Sechar, Near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was located there. Now, I think that's not incidental. I think that it's significant that Jesus taught about the principles of true worship in this precise spot where Jacob's well was located in the valley of Shechem. For Jesus to teach about worship at Jacob's well was significant, I think, in two ways. First is, Jacob was the one who wrestled with God. We see that story in Genesis 32. Jacob wrestles with God all night long. And as the sun comes up, God says to Jacob, let go of me. And Jacob says, no, I won't let go of you. Not until you bless me. And so God blesses Jacob. And he says, Jacob, I'm now going to change your name. Your name will no longer be Jacob. Now your name will be Israel. Because you have struggled with God and you've struggled with humanity and you have prevailed. That's what the name Israel means. The name Israel means to have struggled with God and to have struggled with humanity. So it's fitting that Jesus revealed a teaching about how to worship God at Jacob's well, the one who wrestled with God. And this brings up the first principle. To worship with God does require some struggle. It requires that we are in communication with a living God, with our creator. And if we're going to be in communication in a living relationship with God, we're going to struggle. We're going to have to bring our questions to God, the things that don't seem to make sense to us. Just like the, the woman from, uh, from the well, the, uh, the uh, Samaritan woman, brought her questions to Jesus. We're also going to have to bring all of our feeling, not just our joy, but we're going to have to bring our disappointment and our confusion and our anger sometimes, everything, into this relationship with God. 
So part of what worship is, it's a real relationship. You'll notice today in the service, what we've been doing, we've been communicating with God. We are singing to God and we're praying to God. That's our speech to God, but we're also listening to God and God's word. There is no intellectual question that we can't bring to this faith. And just like Jacob wrestling and struggling with God, expect to be blessed when you come away from this struggle. The second thing that I think is important about this particular location at Jacob's well in the Valley of Shechem <coughs> is this is the exact spot where Jacob and his people buried their foreign gods before worshiping and building an altar to the one true God of all creation. That story is in Genesis chapter 35, verse 4. It says, Jacob's tribe gave Jacob all of the foreign gods that they had, and Jacob buried them under the oak tree at Shechem. That's the second principle. We can't come to worship God, the one God of all creation, the God who gave you life, if we're also holding other things up in our lives as of equal importance to God, or even more important. You've got to take all those things that you're giving your allegiance to and bury them Put them under God. In the Gospel of Matthew 6, 24, it says, No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. We can't serve God in money. We can't serve God in anything else. God alone needs to be worshipped, so we need to bury those other things. The story continues. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water from the well, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now, that's astounding. It's astounding in three ways. First, it was forbidden for Jews to associate with Samaritans because Jews considered Samaritans to be unclean. And the reason they were unclean is they were worshiping in the wrong way. They were worshiping on Mount Gerizim, which was right next to Jacob's well. And they were worshiping in the wrong way. They only believed in part of the Bible, the five books of Moses. They rejected um, the prophets. They had also syncretized their form of Judaism with the religion of the Assyrians who had conquered them many years before. And the Assyrian religion was a polytheistic religion. So you can imagine how offensive that that was to Judaism and to God to be worshiping many gods alongside God. And so in the Jewish faith, they said, well, the Samaritans are unclean. We can't associate with them. So the first strange thing here is Jesus is having a conversation with a Samaritan. The second strange thing here, an astounding thing, is that he's, as a man, relating to a woman, speaking to a woman who he doesn't know. In the cultures of the Middle East, even today, where I served in Oman, that does not happen. A man is forbidden, absolutely forbidden, to speak to a woman whom he is not related to. The only man who would speak to a woman is a relative, a father or a brother or an uncle or a husband, but never a strange man. So that's also astounding here. And the third thing, and maybe the most astounding thing in this story, is that as Jesus talks to this enemy, this unclean person, this person who's lower than him in stature according to Judaism, as he talks to her, he puts himself in a position of need before her. He puts himself in a position of vulnerability before her. He's asking her to help him with something. He's thirsty after a whole day of walking. Will you give me something to drink? So I think Jesus is demonstrating something to us about worship. And this is the third principle. Jesus is showing us that the way to enter worship is with a spirit of reconciliation relating to everyone, even those we would never relate to normally, and allow ourselves even to receive blessing from the very people that we may dislike. In another church that I served, down in Westchester County, there were some members of that church who had big, beautiful 8,000 square foot homes and worked as executives down in New York City. And there were other members in that same church who lived in a trailer park down by the Hudson River. And what was so beautiful, by the way, that only happens in the church. There's nowhere else in society where those two groups will relate to each other. What was so beautiful to me is that the elder who lives in a, in a motor home down by the Hudson River, is serving communion, the body and blood of Christ, to an executive who works down in New York City. That's beautiful. The guy who is a janitor at Stop and Shop praying for the person 
who's just received a cancer diagnosis and works as an executive in New York. I love that. That's the Church of Jesus Christ. And here's the fourth principle. It says Jesus comes to the, the well in need. He makes himself vulnerable to the person who is considered below him in stature. He comes to her saying, give me a drink. And so we too come to the well of worship in need. We come aware that we are thirsty. We come aware of our need for grace, our need for healing, our need for wholeness, which only God can give. And in this story, there's a mutual need. One person's not above another. Jesus is not above this woman. This woman also comes needing what Jesus has to offer, the living water. Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the, I give, the water I give will well up in them like a spring to eternal life. And the woman says, give me this water. And then later she says, I can see that you're a prophet. It's as if she's saying, I've always had this question I've wanted answered about worship. You're a prophet, so maybe you can answer it. She says, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, by which she means Mount Gerizim, right there by Jacob's well. But you Jews, you claim the only place that's legitimate to worship in is Jerusalem. Which is the right form of worship? Jesus' answer is surprising because he does not give the doctrinally correct answer from Judaism, which would be to say, no, you're right, you can't worship on this mountain, you must worship in Jerusalem. No, Jesus says, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. I think what Jesus is saying here is, look, don't get so focused on your traditions. Don't get so hung up on your rituals or your denomination or the correct way to worship. Our rituals are important. They're vehicles to helping us connect with God. But we always make the mistake of getting so focused on the rituals that we forget about God. This happens to me anytime I go and do a funeral at uh, McCool's funeral home. One of the things we do in the funeral liturgy is we lead people in, the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And as a Protestant, I always say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We talked about this recently. But half the people in the funeral home are Catholic, and so they're saying, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And there's always this awkward moment in the prayer where everybody gets a little jumbled up it can be a little off-putting, a little bit uncomfortable when we're worshiping with people who worship differently than we do in a different tradition. But it's as if Jesus is saying, don't worry so much about these differences between you. It was so beautiful what we did last month, having this revival celebration out, outside. We invited churches that, that, are just, that, just, that just never worship together, worshiping together. Pentecostals, worshiping with Baptists, worshiping with Reformed church people. I mean, it was beautiful. And it can also be a little bit confusing and disconcerting and off-putting when we see the different ways that someone else believes or the different way that someone else worships. Jesus is saying, don't let your tradition get in the way of the right spirit of worship. Worshiping the Father, he says, in the spirit and in truth is the kind of worship that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth, he says. Now, the word for truth here in Greek is althea, and it means, it means fact, but it also means sincerity. So this is principle six, worship God in the spirit and in sincerity. When he says worship in the spirit, he's not saying worship in spirit, worship with energy or worship, that could just be a general thing. Worship with gusto. That's not what he's saying. He's saying worship in the Spirit. Worship in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. The article the, he's referring to the Holy Spirit. Worship in the Holy Spirit. The woman clearly doesn't really understand what he's saying, and so she says, okay, well, look, the Messiah is going to come and clear this all up. 
Jesus says to her, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. The Messiah has come. The Messiah is here, and he has explained everything to us. We know that the way to worship is in spirit and truth. So here's the six principles of worship again. Number one, in worship, be ready to wrestle with God and struggle with God and expect to come away blessed. Number two, in order to worship God, you have to bury those things that you've put above God in your life. Bury those things and focus on God. Number three, enter worship with the spirit of reconciliation, being ready to join in fellowship with people who you might not normally associate with, people who you might not even like to associate with. Number four, come to worship aware of your need. Come thirsty. Come being willing to receive help from the least likely person, receiving help also from the Holy Spirit. Number five, don't let a preoccupation with the right way to worship, the rituals, the tradition, don't let that get in the way or distract you from true worship. Number six, true worship is worshiping in the power of the Holy Spirit and in sincerity. Let us pray. Lord, we are like the woman at the well. We also come to you in need. Every one of us has so many different needs. You know our needs. We come to you thirsty. God, give us your living water, the water that wells up into eternal life in our hearts, the presence of the Spirit. And help us to worship you in the Spirit and in sincerity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The hymn is How Firm a Foundation, hymn 612.
Sunday's worship service this morning, we sang from the hymn, God is Here. We sang, we wait for the coming of his spirit into open minds and hearts. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 